nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, first of all, you, you all understand that Professor Alam and Professor Dada, these, are, these set a very high standard, right? Don't expect me to live up to that, but I'll do the best I can. Um, my, my job this afternoon is to try to relate all of the concepts that you heard from Professor Dada yesterday to some real data. Show you how we apply it to real data, how we interpret and understand what's going on. I'm going to make use of published data, and that's always very dangerous, right? Because um, you don't know, you can't ask the people questions, you can't look at them when they're doing the measurements, you don't know what they're not showing you, things like this. But there's been a lot of data that's been shown, and it's more or less consistent, and there is a general understanding of this is the way things work. So the problem that we're talking about is you have a sheet of graphene, you apply a small voltage between the two terminals, you're making a graphene resistor. What is the resistance? How do we relate it to band structure and scattering uh, mechanisms and how do we figure out what's going on? Uh, it's still a field that is uh, evolving. So there are still people that are debating about, well, is this the explanation or is that the explanation? There are still some details that haven't been sorted out. So I'm going to, I'll try to illustrate where or discuss where some of those are. Now, we're doing some of our own measurements here. Well, at Professor Appenzeller and Yang Shui, where's Yang? They're doing it in the lab here. Um, so I've asked them to sit in and give me a hard time if I'm saying something that's not correct. And if we have questions, they may be able to, to reply from their own perspective of actually being in the lab and, and doing these measurements. And I'd like to thank uh, Dionysus, who helped me pull this together, and along with several other people. Tony Lowe did a lot, and uh, as I said, it, it's going to apply the concepts that Ciprio talked about to this problem of uh, graphene conductance. And uh, Professor Appenzeller and uh, Yang Shui we spent a lot of time with. There's a set of notes that go along with this lecture. So this lecture is pretty descriptive. I'm not going to derive anything. I'm going to sort of remind you of what you saw with Professor Dada's lectures. Uh, some of these things, uh, integrals, can be worked out rather easily, but we have a nice set of notes where everything is worked out. So if you'd like to see how it's done, what you should concentrate here on is getting the main ideas of, of what's done, and you can go back and get the mathematical details uh, with those lecture notes that are in your notebook. Okay, so what are we trying to do? I guess we don't need to say anything about graphene. We, we all know what it is. There's this nice little tool on the NanoHub that runs really quickly. And I think later on today we're going to have a session um, where we will rerun this tool and illustrate some of the band structure concepts that Professor Dada was, uh, was discussing yesterday. So the point is it has a really unusual electronic structure that is different from most semiconductors that has people really excited that this ought to be good for something. It's not clear what, you know, <laughs> but, but I agree that it probably is. It is so different. There are probably some really, some things that are difficult to do by other means that we can, that we can uh, put graphene to use for. So it's great fun. There's all kinds of really interesting science going on, and uh, everybody is trying to sort out where are the applications and what do we do with this. Tomorrow you'll hear a lecture from Professor Oppenzeller from, you know, more of a, I don't know whether he's an experimentalist or a theorist. He's sort of both. And he's, he's working on device applications and uh, is really pursuing a number of, uh, of specific uh, potential device applications. And you'll hear about that tomorrow. So my objectives are very simple. So describe the technique that people commonly use to measure the resistance or conductance of graphene, to show some typical results, and then to talk about how we understand the characteristics that we see. So feel free to interrupt uh, anytime you have some questions. So just a little bit of theory, as I said, not very much. We'll just remind you of some things you saw yesterday. So we all know now about this band structure of graphene. Uh, it's two-dimensional, so k is a vector in the xy plane. We have this, we have two equivalent valleys, so whenever we're computing conductance and things, we have to remember to multiply by two for spin, but also two because there are two equivalent valleys. 
And it has this interesting uh, band structure where nominally in pure graphene, the Fermi level is right at the intersection of the cone. So all the states below it are filled. The T equals zero, all above it are empty. That point is the neutral point where we've got an equal number of positive charges below if they're empty states and negative charges above if they're filled. And it's also called the Dirac point because of the relation to this Dirac equation that Pre Professor Dada discussed yesterday. So the EK around one of these points can be described by this simple relation. So uh, E is plus or minus H bar VF, the Fermi velocity, uh, which is constant, times the magnitude of K. And the magnitude of that velocity, one of the unusual things is it doesn't matter how far it is above the band minima or where it is in the band, the velocity is constant. Of course, if you go far enough away from this point, it'll be different. But we're going to stick near this point. And it's about 1 times 10 to the 8th centimeters per second, which is sort of an order of magnitude faster than electrons move when they move very fast in most semiconductors. So it has people interested in uh, applications about uh, high-speed electronics. And the density of states, I think Professor Dada worked this out yesterday. It's worked out again in the notes. So it goes linearly with energy. Uh, for this particular E of K, you can work out the 2D density of states, and it's zero at this um, neutral point. And then it increases with energy when you go above. Think about that as the conduction band, and it increases with energy when you go below linearly. Think about that like the valence band. So we're going to refer to the case when the Fermi level is above the neutral point as n-type graphene, and we're going to refer to the case when uh, the Fermi level is below as p-type graphene. Okay, and we're going to be interested in a very simple problem, just a resistor. So we're looking down at the top. We have this sheet of graphene. I think Professor Appenzeller might show you some real pictures of what these look like, and they're not quite as uniform and square. Um, but we're going to think about them as a resistor with some length L, some width W. We have a couple of contacts applied at the end. And the contacts are these Landauer contacts. They're big. There's a lot of scattering. There's a well-defined thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, each one has its own Fermi level. So there are two different Fermi functions. Fermi level is shifted by a little bit. We're only going to be considering small biases here, low field transport, not high field. So we begin with this Landauer formalism, where the current is 2Q over H. We have to do an integral over all those energy states. T is the transmission. M is the number of conducting channels, sort of velocity times density of states. Professor Dada talked about that, too. And then current flows when there's a difference in Fermi levels. But we're only going to consider the case when there's a very small difference in Fermi levels, because there's a small voltage applied. So you can approximate this difference by a derivative. That's where the the F, the E comes in, and F naught now is just to remind us that we're near equilibrium, so this is the equilibrium Fermi function. You can pick contact one or contact two because the bias is so small that everything is basically the same. And current is only going to flow at the Fermi level, or states very, very close to the Fermi level. Okay, so we could plug in things. We know what the Fermi function is. We saw this uh, expression for the transmission function. So this is a number between 0 and 1. So we're thinking about this as a, in a semi-classical picture. This is, you know, there's no phase involved in what we're going to do. Um, if the mean free path lambda is very much longer than L, then this is 1. Everything transmits across. If it's very much smaller, then only some small fraction transmits across. And we know we have the expression for the number of modes, conducting channels, I think Professor Dada worked that out yesterday. So we put all of these in and do the integral, and we've got an expression. And if you look at the notes, that's done. The unpleasant thing is, you know, you get these Fermi-Dirac integrals and things like that if you do it above t equals zero. But, but at t equals zero, things are really simple. So let's just talk about t equals zero. I think Professor Dada also talked about how this Fermi function goes from one to zero at the Fermi level. And if that's reasonably sharp, then we can think about that as a delta function at the Fermi level. Then the integrals become easy, because we just pull the integrand out and evaluate everything at the Fermi level. So our conductance is 2Q squared over H times the transmission at the Fermi level times the number of conducting channels at the Fermi level. 
And what we're going to be interested in now is as we dope graphene differently, N-type or P-type, move the Fermi level around, how do we change the conductance? And how do we understand what we measure? So to begin with the Fermi level, if it's, everything is perfect and there are no potentials applied or stray charges, the Fermi level is right at the intersection. And if we were able to move the Fermi level up in the conduction band, then we expect the conductance to increase linearly with the Fermi level because the, dense, the number of channels increases linearly with energy, assuming that this transmission is more or less constant. Now, it might have some energy dependence too. And if we move the Fermi level down into the valence band, all that matters is that we have states around the Fermi level, so we're going to have a conductance, and everything is symmetrical. The density of states increases below the neutral point also, so the conductance would increase linearly. Everything would be symmetrical. It would be ambipolar. We'd have conduction if we move the Fermi level up or if we move the Fermi level down. Okay, uh, frequently experimentalists, you don't really know directly where the Fermi level is in the semiconductor experimentally. You have to have some kind of model and compute it. You know things, what, what you are much more likely to know, and we'll talk about it in a minute, is how many electrons there are or how many holes there are. So that's the electron density n sub s per square centimeter. So we have this expression for the conductance. Now if I plot it versus electron density instead of versus Fermi level, then I won't get a linear plot like this dashed line that we showed before. It'll look a little bit different. And I, I don't recall now, Professor Dada probably did this too. You can, at t equals zero, it's uh, easy to derive a relation between the Fermi level and the, uh, and the number of carriers. The number of carriers goes as the square of the Fermi level. If you forgot that from Professor Dada's lecture, that's in the notes also. So the important point is that the carrier density goes as Fermi level squared. So that means that the conductance in, uh, instead of increasing linearly with Fermi energy because the number of modes increases linearly with Fermi energy, it's going to increase as the square root of carrier density. So if we plot the conductance versus carrier density, which will be more convenient to do experimentally, we'll get plots that look like this. They'll have some curvature. Again, assuming that the transmission <laughs> is about constant. And that will be affected by the scattering processes, and we'll have to talk about that later. Okay, so what about at t equals, at t greater than zero, then things get a little more complicated. I have these integrals that I have to work out with these Fermi functions. I get these Fermi Dirac integrals of different orders that I have to worry about. But you can see sort of physically what's going to happen. The Fermi function will go from one to zero over some width and energy that's on the order of kT. So there will be some spread. There will be some places where some of the states are empty below the Fermi level. Some of the states are filled above the Fermi level. And I'll just have to do this averaging process. And that's what happens when you, when you do the integral. So if I move it up, I'll average over those states that are higher in energy. If I move the Fermi level down, I'll do some averaging over the states that are down. And I expect something, if I get very, very far above the minimum, uh, you know, then it begins to look like a metal and I'm back to the case where it looks sort of like a delta function now. That spread is very much smaller than the energy that I'm at. If I get near the bottom, uh, I get some rounding because now I don't go to, now I have a few states filled in the conduction band, I have a few states that are empty in the valence band, and, uh, and I have to make some corrections around there. So I can think about this as the average transmission times the number of channels, the average quantity near the Fermi level. And when I do that integral, I get the appropriate average. Now, the, uh, so the key equations that we're going to work with, these t equals zero equations are so simple that these are the only ones I'm going to work with. I don't want to work with Fermi Dirac integrals or anything. So we'll just work with the t equals zero relations. So the conductance, it's a nice, easy expression and simple to remember and very physical. It's the quantum of conductance. 
times the transmission at the Fermi energy times the number of channels at the Fermi energy. Okay. And it doesn't matter, you know, there are states everywhere except exactly at E equals zero, that Dirac point. And uh, if I have T greater than zero, then I have to add the conductance of the conduction band and the conduction of the valence band. Right, there are two contributions. We have an expression for the number of modes, basically velocity times density of states. It's, it goes linearly with energy, just like the density of states is, because when I multiply velocity times density of states, for graphene, velocity is constant. So both of them go linearly with energy. In most semiconductors, they have different dependencies with energy. The uh, transmission is given by this formula that Professor Dada discussed uh, mm -hmm. yesterday. So we have a simple expression for the conductance at zero Kelvin. Okay. Now, people frequently like to write this. You know, if you have a large resistor, you like to write the conductance as the sheet conductance times width divided by length. You make it twice as wide, the conductance is twice as big. You make it twice as long, the conductance is, is half. Okay. So that makes sense if you're diffusive in a normal resistor. It wouldn't make much, it doesn't really make sense if you're ballistic, because you make something ballistic twice as long, it doesn't matter. It's, you know, it can go twice as far just as easily. But people frequently do this. So when you're analyzing experimental data, sometimes it's not always, this is one of the difficulties in pulling numbers out of the papers, because you can't go to the people and ask them, okay, what's your W and what's your L? Sometimes they tell you. Sometimes you have a little piece of graphene that's kind of irregular and it's not exactly clear what's W and what's L, so you're kind of trying to get close. But people will do that and then they'll extract and frequently what they're plotting is not the raw data, which would I, I over V, which is what you would like to see, and then make your own decision about what W and L are. What they will frequently plot is this sheet conductance. Or they usually call it the conductivity sigma. In 2D, they're the same thing. Mohs per square. So it's that G sub S that we get. Now, if I factor a W over L out of this expression, then I can find out what this G sub S is. And if you do that, it will we'll, we'll factor this L out. So I'll take an L out, I'll have to multiply by an L on top, and I'm going to call that quantity the apparent mean free path. It's just some algebra because I insist on interpreting things in this diffusive picture when I shouldn't always do that. And that apparent mean free path will be the smaller of two quantities. It'll be either the real mean free path in a big piece of graphene, the average distance between scattering events, or it will be the length between the two contacts, whichever one is shorter. So it's sort of this picture that Professor Alam alluded to when you have a ballistic piece of graphene and you're thinking about, you know, mobility and what's the scattering time or what's the mean free path, well, it's actually limited by the contacts because you scatter in the first contact, you go across the resistor, you scatter in the second contact, so the mean free path is the length of the channel. Can't ever be longer than that. Okay, so I'll just mention an aside. In uh, introductory semiconductor courses, we teach students a lot about Non-degenerate Fermi, a non-degenerate semiconductor has a Fermi level way below the conduction band, and you can use Boltzmann statistics, and the integrals are easy to work out. When it's degenerate, usually the Fermi level is around the bottom of the band or a little bit above the bottom. It doesn't get too much beyond that. And then you have these Fermi-Dirac integrals and things just get messy. If you're a metal, you can go back and assume that the Fermi function is a delta function and everything gets easy again. So in graphene, you know, almost always your Fermi level is way above the minimum of the conduction band or way below. And actually, the T equals zero expressions work out really very, very well. So it's, you can go ahead and you can use the T equals zero expressions. You can always go ahead and use the full expressions if you want to, but the T equals zero expressions work really well and they're much easier to help you understand what's going on. Uh, there's a little bit of error when you get right near the Dirac point, but there are other reasons that you shouldn't use any of this right near the Dirac point anyway. So we'll stay away from the Dirac point, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I'm only going to use T equals zero Kelvin results, and really it works just fine. I'm not making much of an approximation. 
Okay, so the questions that we have are, if we're able, well, how do we do this experiment? Experimentally, how do we do this? And some of you, I think, are probably doing this experiment, so you know how it's done. But we want to talk briefly about how do you move the Fermi level around while you're measuring the conductance. And then we want to look at some of the results and see if we can compare them to what we expect. So I just described sort of what you'd expect to see. We'll look at some data and we'll see what we really do see. And it won't look exactly the way I sketched. And it's because even though graphene has very long mean free paths and the mobilities are very high, uh, there is some scattering. And you'll see that reflected in the shape of the characteristics. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna say a little bit about the experiments. And, uh, and we can discuss a little bit more about how that's done. So experimentally, it's difficult to dope graphene. You know, in bulk semiconductors, you dope them. That's how you move the Fermi level in the conduction band or the valence band. In graphene, you do it with a gate. Some, some people will call this electrostatic doping. Uh, it's just modulating the potential in the graphene with a gate so that you can change the position of the Fermi level with respect to the neutral point. And in a typical experiment, we have a layer of graphene that is placed on a layer of silicon dioxide. I think Professor Appenzeller might talk a little bit about how you make these. Or you come up. So the experimentalists have these very clever ways, these very sophisticated ways they've, talked, they've discovered to do this using scotch tape. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, it's, it's interesting. You, you read these papers, and they will even tell you what brand of 3M scotch tape they used. You know, <laughs> Because you know, it's very important to be able to reproduce this, that you get the stickiness just right. And even that, it takes a lot of trial and error before yeah, you get the hang of it. It's about the same when you buy it in New York or in Indiana. OK. <laughs> OK. You know, and they discovered if you put it on a 300 nanometer thick SiO2, then you can see one monolayer of it. I think that's 90 nanometers you can also see. So, you know, it's, it's really, it's actually quite impressive. OK, so this is what the structures look like. Uh, this, is, this is a side view. So you take a silicon wafer. You know, it, its only function is to hold everything up, right, and, and to serve as a substrate. Here's an SiO2 layer whose thickness is usually picked such that when I put one monolayer of graphene on, you can look through a microscope and you can see it. You know, the interference fringes are just right. And then you put a couple of contacts on and you make a resistor. The uh, silicon layer is doped on the bot, you know, the silicon below it. So that, that's like, a, it's going to serve as a gate. We're going to apply a voltage at the bottom, and that's going to change the potential in the graphene on the top. If you look at the top view over here on the right, you can see the width and the, and the length. And when you see pictures of the real ones, you know, you take this off by scotch tape and put it down and put some contacts on. They don't, the W and the L aren't quite as clearly defined. But. And you can use different metals, uh, contacts, and uh, different thicknesses of SiO2, but it, it's typically fairly thick SiO2. You know, those 90 nanometer numbers are very thick. You know, what are, what are they in a, in a CMOS chip these days? One point some nanometers, yeah. So these, these are pretty thick layers typically. Okay, now there are also some beautiful experiments that people have done uh, at Columbia and I think probably one or two other places where you can build this structure and then etch the SiO2 out from underneath it. So it's suspended. It's not sitting on something that might have some stray charges and things in it that could affect the measurements. And we'll talk about what happens when you do measurements on this suspended graphene also. Okay, so the measurement is, is very simple. You can do them two terminal or four terminal. So this is a two terminal measurement. You apply a voltage across the two contacts, measure the current, and Divide the two and get the conductance, and you can plot either the conductance or one over the conductance, the resistance. And you can do that at a fixed temperature, and then you can sweep the voltage on the bottom. And when you do that, you'll move the potential of that neutral point up or down, and you'll move the Fermi level into the conduction band or the valence band. And you can plot out these characteristics of conductance versus gate voltage. Or you can sit at some gate voltage and vary the temperature and see how things vary versus temperature. And as I mentioned earlier, 
frequently what's reported is not the direct measurement of I divided by V, but it's this sheet conductance. So the W and L are factored out. Okay. Now, just a word about using the uh, gate voltage to change the Dirac point. So I'm going to draw the pictures this way. And you know, so the picture will be that we apply a positive gate voltage. So physically, you can think what's going to happen is the positive gate voltage is going to attract negative electrons in the graphene. So it must mean the Fermi level is up in, into the uh, conduction band. So we'll usually draw our pictures like this. Now the Fermi level has moved up into the conduction band. What's really happened is that we've taken the Dirac point and we've lowered the energy of all the electrons by minus Q times the gate voltage or whatever the potential is inside the graphene. We, we pulled the Dirac point down and the Fermi level hasn't moved. But it's just easier for me to draw the pictures this way. All that matters is the relative distance between the Fermi level and the Dirac point. So positive gate voltage, the Fermi level goes up. Uh, negative gate voltage, we're going to attract positive holes in the graphene. So the Fermi level should be in the valence band and it'll get pulled down. Now, if you want to solve, well, let's see what we're doing here. If you typically do a measurement, you'll get something like this. Now, ideally, if there were no stray charges and there were no work function differences between the metal electrode and the graphene, everything would, you, would uh, go through zero at Vg equals zero. Experimentally, it doesn't. There's some offset. There's some stray charges. There are some work function differences, just like you have in an MOS capacitor, you know, flat band voltage. So people will typically find out what that is, and then they will translate that offset to the origin, and you'll plot the characteristics like those dashed lines. Okay. Now, C times V is charge. So it turns out that for most cases, that's a really, that's all there is to the story. That's a really good approximation. So Q times the charge in the graphene, that's the total amount of charge per square centimeter in the graphene, is just the capacitance of that insulating layer, epsilon of SiO2 divided by that 300 nanometers or 90 nanometers or whatever it is, uh, divided, so times the gate voltage, times Vg prime after I've made this shift. So it's like Vg minus the threshold voltage, and the threshold voltage is zero. Now, that doesn't always work. Um, you know, if you're solving for this problem, it's just like solving an MOS capacitor. And uh, there is a capacitance of the graphene, people call the quantum capacitance, that's in series with the insulator capacitance. And if you solve it, you find that this is an approximation that works really well if the oxides are reasonably thick. And most of these oxides in these experiments are reasonably thick. But if you want to see how it works for like one or two nanometer oxides, it'd be a little more involved, the relation between NS and VG. And that's worked out in the notes too, I think. Is that right? So if you're actually building a high performance device, your gate insulator would be very thin and the relation would be a little more complicated than this. But for the, these kinds of experiments that we're doing, it's very easy. So when we plot conductance versus gate voltage, we're really plotting conductance versus sheet carrier density in the graphene. It's the same thing. Okay, so now we can look at some results and we can see if we can make sense of them. So here's a typical measurement. If now it's, uh, it's, it's from a review article that's recent. I think the, the measurements themselves were done, what, some, you probably know, three or four years ago which is like ancient history in graphene, but it's still, it's a nice looking plot. So you're seeing things look sort of like what we talked about. Um, in this case, they have a, a nicely structured piece of graphene. They must have etched this somehow. I don't know how, yeah. Oxygen, oxygen etched? Oxygen, oxygen. oxygen, plasma etched, okay. I knew there was a good reason I invited you to sit down in front with me, <laughs> so I, I will rely on you more. So you, you can see this resistance. This is a four probe measurement. So here you can pump the current in. You can measure the voltage between these two probes. The width looks like it's one micrometer. The length is five micrometers or 5,000 nanometers. The oxide sitting underneath this thing is 300 nanometers thick. 
spectrum, typical experiment. And we're plotting the sheet conductance here. And the temperature is quite low, 10 degrees Kelvin. Okay. Okay, so we could try to make sense out of this data. We have this basic expression that we showed a little bit earlier, which tells me what the conductance should be. Uh, we plot it versus gate voltage. So there is a relation between the gate voltage, tells us what the carrier density is. The carrier density is related to the Fermi level. So I can deduce what the Fermi level is at any point, and then I can deduce, I can put that in, I can take the measured sheet conductance and the Fermi level then, and I can deduce what the apparent mean free path is. Okay. So there's a very simple relation. I can just solve these two equations for the apparent mean free path, and Professor Dada mentioned this yesterday too. So I take the measured sheet conductance in units of 2q squared over h. I divide by the square root of the carrier density, which I determine from the gate voltage, and I can find out what the mean free path is. Right. Very easy. And again, I'm using these t equals zero expressions, but they're really quite good. So let's go up here, where the gate voltage is high. The sheet conductance is about three millisiemens. Uh, I know the gate voltage, it's about 100 volts with a 300 nanometer thick oxide. So we have about seven times 10 to the 12th carriers per square centimeter. So are people calibrated to this? Is that, is that a high sheet density? Yeah. So ab about the highest you can get in, say, a CMOS transistor, if you apply it under on-current conditions, is about 10 to the 13th. So this is, a, this is a good hefty charge. Fermi level is way above the bottom of the, of the way above that Dirac point, that neutral point. In fact, you know, we have all the information. It's 3 tenths of an EV above. We can just work that out. And we find an apparent mean free path that's 130 nanometers. So this thing is 5,000 nanometers long, and the mean free path is 130 nanometers. So it's diffusive. There's a lot of scattering going on between, between the two contacts. So the apparent mean free path is the real mean free path, because it's the shorter of the length of the resistor and the actual distance between scattering events and graphene. Now, we could go down here. We could go at a lower gate voltage, and we could repeat the exercise. So the sheet conductance there is half because this is a straight line. It's 1.5 millisiemens. The uh, carrier density is half because it's the same capacitance times half the voltage. So it's 3.6 times 10 to the 12th. Um, we can deduce, but the Fermi level, the carrier density goes as a square of the Fermi level. So the Fermi level isn't half. It's, instead of being 0.3, it's 0.2. And I can go through the exercise and I can deduce the apparent mean free path. And it's 90 nanometers. So it's different. The mean free path is energy dependent. It's different at the higher energy in the band than it is at the lower energy. So something is, some type of scattering is going on. Now it's, it's interesting to note that the ratio of the mean free paths is about two thirds. And the ratio of the Fermi energy, when I did the calculation first up here, and when I do the calculation now, the ratio of those two energies is about two-thirds. So what that's telling us is that the mean free path in this sample is proportional to energy. The higher the energy, if the energy is doubled, the mean free path is doubled. So that should be telling us something about the scattering processes. You know, so people start to think what scattering processes are proportional to energy, and maybe that's the one that's controlling the performance of this particular resistor. Okay. Now, mobility. So, you know, people like to talk about mobility. And the reason is because we're used to thinking of things like sheet conductance is sheet carrier density times Q times mobility. Now, that's always true in the sense that I can always make this definition. And then I can divide the measured conductance by the measured sheet carrier density in Q, and I'll find out what the mobility is. Now, in this case, it makes, it makes a lot of sense to talk about a mobility because there is a region, quite a long region here, where the conductance is proportional to the carrier density. So the mobility is just some constant number. 
And you can do the math, and it's 12,500 centimeters squared per volt second. So that's, is that a, so is that a, a good mobility? Is it a, Pardon me? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's good, but there are other semiconductors that, have, that are much higher. But this is, you know, this is a little bit old. People can do better than this now. But it's, it, it's a pretty high mobile. It's like 10 times higher than silicon. But it's also at 10 degrees Kelvin. Right, so. um, OK, now let, let's go down here at this minimum point, And let's run through the same exercise. So you know, it's sort of, I said that the carrier density is the capacitance times the gate voltage. The gate voltage is 0. So it says NS is 0. So now I, I really shouldn't use this T equals 0 expression anymore. Because you know now it's important to get this little thermal spread, you know. But at 10 degrees Kelvin, there isn't very much thermal spread. So if I attempt to do this, and even if I attempt to do it um, rigorously, you know, using the proper expressions with Fermi-Dirac integrals, I'll be led to the conclusion that suddenly the mean free path is is big up here at high gate voltage. It's dropping linearly. And then when it gets in this region, it turns around and it goes off to infinity. Right? Doesn't make any sense. Right? It really, it's, what it's an indication of is that something else is happening here. And uh, the something else that's happening, or what people think is happening, is that in this region, if, if you have a, a large piece of graphene, and it's sitting on silicon dioxide, and it's sitting in the ambient. There are stray charges all over the place that are pulling the Dirac point up and down. And you have these puddles, they call them, where some places it's p-type, some places it's n-type. And the conduction is, is different. We developed a theory for which everything is uniform. The Fermi level is in one place. The Dirac point is in one place. It's uniform. And it's not. And so our theory really only works when we get out of this regime and we're well above those fluctuations. When we get down in there, then uh, there are many papers. Professor Alam alluded to it on uh, you know, percolation theory. And uh, so something different is going on there. And I guess it's, a, it's an area that we're, we're doing some looking at with Professor Alam and Tony Lowe. And we haven't fully digested all of that yet. It's not, as Professor Alam mentioned, it's not exactly like the classic percolation theory that he talks about where you you have these regions where you have these very big differences between conductivity, either it conducts or it doesn't conduct. We will see in the last lecture that PN junctions in graphene don't block current very well. So, so it's an interesting region. Lots of papers being written about it. For the purpose of this lecture, I'm just going to stay away from it. It's not the point of this lecture. OK, so there are lots of people doing, doing some really nice experiments. So this comes from Michael Fuhrer's group in the uh, University of Maryland. And this is doping. So, and the way it is done is by exposing the graphene to potassium. And so my understanding of this is it's not done at a high temperature. It's not substitutional doping the way you would dope silicon. You, know, you, you put a material on top of graphene. You expose it to it. There is some charge transfer between that material and the underlying graphene, and you effectively dope it. So I would think of it as something like modulation doping in a semiconductor. And what we're seeing here are the pristine curve, zero seconds exposure. And you can see this nice symmetrical characteristic. And you can see it's not linear the way the previous one was. You know, different samples show different characteristics. So it's a little bit different. And now what you'll observe is that as you increase the exposure to phosphorus, you move this neutral point to the left. And you know if you had an MOS capacitor, you would shift the flat band voltage by minus charge over C ox. So this suggests that you have some kind of positive charge from the phosphorus. And the more phosphorus you put down, the more positive charge you have. So it shifts the neutral point. Right, that part's easy to understand from MOS electrostatics. But it also changes the slope. And you can see that these curves become more and more linear. And the more you expose them to phosphorus, the less the slope is. Pardon me? Potassium. potassium. What did I say? Some, oh, potassium. All right. All right. So that's, um, 
So that's an observation of what happens experimentally. So let's look at this undoped sample, first of all. Remember, I, I showed you a, uh, a plot earlier on where we were trying to understand what the shape of these characteristics should be if you plotted them versus carrier density or gate voltage, which is the same thing. And we said if the transmission was constant, it should go as a square root. So this sort of looks like it might be going as a square root. Maybe it's not quite as strong. I should probably plot it versus square root of voltage. Um, the transmission is constant when you're ballistic. It's just one. But it might also be constant if, you're, if your mean free path is constant. It isn't changing. So we could ask ourselves, are we anywhere near the ballistic limit in this sample before we expose it to uh, potassium? Well, you just plug in numbers, just like we did before. It's 164 nanometers. And I think the scale of this, I forget. It's a micron scale length. So it's a diffusive sample. So we're not near the ballistic limit. Um, now, you can also look at these samples. And you can sit at a particular gate voltage. And you can measure. Now, here. Here we're doing one over the conductance. So we're plotting the resistivity instead of the conductivity. So the vertical axis is, so you have to invert it. I'm sorry, it's the only plot I had. So you have to invert it. You're plotting, and what we're doing here is just two different samples. And you're sitting at some particular gate voltage that's away from this minimum where our theory should apply. And you're plotting resistivity versus temperature. And you can see the resistivity increasing linearly with temperature. And then when the temperature gets hot enough, around 200K or so, it starts to increase faster than linearly. And, uh, and I guess this is being done for probably uh, the different samples that were exposed to, uh, to potassium. So experimentally, we observed that for temperatures below 100 degrees K, the resistivity is proportional to temperature. And people say that's due to acoustic phonon scattering. We'll talk about why in a minute. And for higher temperatures, the resistivity starts to have an exponential characteristic. And people are still arguing about this. Some people say that it's due to uh, polar phonons in the SiO2 underneath. And those polar phonons have an electric field that then scatters the electrons and the graphene on top of it. And other people are saying, no, it can be just explained with the optical phonons and the graphene itself. So you know, it, it just isn't resolved yet. But we can understand what's going on here. The, the resistivity that's being plotted is 1 over the conductance. The conductance is proportional to the mean free path. So it's 1 over the uh, mean free path. And the mean free path is related to scattering. And scattering is going to be related to how many phonons that are there to scatter. So we expect the resistivity to be proportional to the phonon occupation number. The more phonon, the hotter it is, the more phonons there are, the more scattering is going to occur. And the phonon occupation number is given by this Bose-Einstein factor. Now, for acoustic phonons, you can go through these energy momentum conservation arguments and find out which acoustic phonons are responsible for scattering. And it turns out that uh, unless you go to extremely low temperatures, you can think of acoustic phonon scattering as an elastic process. The average acoustic phonon that's scattering an electron has an h bar omega that's small compared to kT. When people go down to really low temperatures, they have to worry about this energy exchange. But at uh, reasonable temperatures, you can assume acoustic phonon scattering is elastic. Yeah. Yeah, elastic. No, no, no. No change in energy. So if h bar omega, the phonon energy, is much less than kT, then I can expand e to the x as 1 minus x. And this typical approximation you make then for acoustic phonons at temperatures that aren't too low is that the number of acoustic phonons is kT divided by h bar omega. Okay. So the number of acoustic phonons is proportional to temperature. And the measured resistivity is proportional to temperature. So that's why the experimentalists will suspect that in that regime I'm being dominated by acoustic phonon scattering. You calculate the scattering rates. I think we even 
We do that in the notes too, don't we? We calculate the scattering rate for acoustic phonon scattering. It's going to depend on a deformation potential. And with some reasonable numbers for the deformation potential, you can account for the measured data. Although there's a lot of spread in what people think the deformation potential is. How about impurities? No, we haven't talked about impurities yet. So one step at a time. We'll get. All right, so optical phonons. Optical phonons have a lot of energy. Right? So if you're at low temperatures, um, the electrons don't have enough energy to excite an optical phonon. And there isn't enough thermal energy for, them, for there to be any population of them. But if you increase the temperature enough, then this factor can start to become big enough and you can get some uh, population of optical phonons. And in that case, you would expect to have this exponential characteristic. And that explains the rise. The thing that's not exactly clear is where those optical phonons are coming. And as I said, there's still some debate. This is still a new field. Some people say they're coming from the SiO2 underneath. Some people say, no, those are optical. We can explain that with the optical phonons that are present in the graphene. And of course, people are using different deformation potentials, and it's not quite clear what that is. So th there's still some uncertainty that's being sorted out. OK, now there are these interesting experiments on uh, suspended. Remember I talked that there are people who etch the SiO2 out from underneath. And when you do that, you get a curve here that's blue that looks very much like the ones we got before. But then if you heat that up and drive the impurities off, you have a very clean piece of graphene with no stray charges around it. And then you get the red curves. So you can see initially they were linear. So you kind of suspect when we doped it with potassium, the curves became linear. When they were on the substrate where there might be a lot of stray charges around, the curves were linear. Uh, before we annealed it, when there might be a lot of gunk on the films, they're linear. But after you anneal that all off, they become nonlinear. Now, you can see, uh, oops, before we do that, there's a dashed line here and there's a solid line. And as Professor Dada mentioned, that people frequently you know, don't, don't always appreciate that this Landauer formalism can work in the diffusive limit or in the ballistic limit. So what the dashed line is, is a Landauer calculation in the ballistic limit, which is what people typically do. And the fact that it is very close to the measured results suggests that that annealed sample is operating almost at the ballistic limit. But we can just apply our theory, this apparent mean-free path, the apparent mean free path will be the length of the resistor if you're at the ballistic limit. And if you deduce an apparent mean free path here, it's about 1300 nanometers. And if you look at this picture here, it's a, you know, here's two nanometers. So this distance between these voltage contacts here looks like it's less than two. That's about the length of the resistor. So it makes sense. It looks like it could be. And one of the differences you'll notice here, you know, it, the last data, if I were, this minimum point here is actually quite high. Right? If I were to extrapolate these linear regions down and go to zero gate voltage, there would be a, quite a lot of conductance that's residual conductance that's still there. And I don't know what that might be. Is that some leakage around the edges or some shunt conduction path? But it's, it's quite large in this sample. So that's different. I, I guess we'll talk about that a little more later. OK, I want to say just a word or two about mobility. Because a lot of people that do experiments and measure mobility, the uh, objective seems to be to report the highest possible mobility. But mobility is kind of a fuzzy concept. And it's not always, mean-free path is always very clear. We know what mean-free path is. But when conductance isn't proportional to carrier density, it's not always obvious exactly what the mobility is. You can always make the definition, conductance is NQ times mobility, so you can always do that. So, um, but this expression, this is the right expression. Um, and what that says is that the conductance is proportional to the mean free path times the square root of carrier density, not times carrier density. Okay. So I can always make this definition and then I can go ahead and I can, if I were to divide my measured conductance 
by the square root of the carrier density, I would get a mobility. Right? So if I were doing that in a sample like this, I would try to get the carrier density as small as possible because then I would measure a mobility that's as high as possible. But, it, but the mean free path itself might be constant the whole time. You know, it's probably a more meaningful physical quantity. So there are kind of two cases here. If we have an apparent mean free path, which might be energy dependent, if it's proportional to energy, uh, which is one second, if the mean free path is proportional to energy, then energy is proportional to the square root of carrier density. So square root of carrier density times square, square root of carrier density, that would give me a conductance that's proportional to carrier density. And then I could pull a mobility off anywhere on that plot and it would be the same and it would make a lot of sense to do it. But if the mean free path is constant, then the conductance then is proportional to the square root of carrier density and then I get a mobility that depends on carrier density. And then you have to be very careful when you're comparing numbers between labs. Okay, what carrier density did you do that at? And nothing very complicated is going on. It's just a constant mean free path. Is there a question? So th this is a sample where, first of all, the graphene was on the SiO2, right? And then the SiO2 underneath the sample was etched out. Okay. So after it was etched out, then this curve was measured. But after the etching process, you know, there may have been stray charges and things that were left on the graphene. So then the graphene was heated up and annealed to drive all of that stuff off. And the idea was to produce as clean a piece of graphene with as little stuff on it as possible. And when after that annealing process, then the conductance got much higher and more nonlinear. So is there an explanation that uh, why this curve is not symmetrical? Oh, that, that's a good question. Why is this curve not symmetrical? So let me ask you to ignore that for now. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to mention that on my very last slide as one of the reasons that you should stay for my last lecture of the summer school, right? <laughs> Let me just defer that. But that's, so, you know, what I'm going to do is to say, oh, okay, this is the good side. This is the side I'm always going to analyze because it looks better. Okay. Something is going on here. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about that briefly at the, at the end and I'll talk about it more in the, in the very last lecture. They're not always symmetrical. Okay, so just a summary. Um, the low conductance samples, we often see a conductance that's proportional to carrier density. If we get away from this minimum where we shouldn't be because that requires a different theory. The higher conductance samples are frequently nonlinear. They look like they sort of like the square root of carrier density but not exactly. Um, the conductance decreases with temperature. People call that metallic. That's sort of what you'd expect. More phonons, more scattering. Um, but it can become super linear if you go high enough, and that means there's phonons with a higher energy. Let's see, the best mobilities, if we've got our numbers correct, the best ones that we can find these days are on the substrate are around 30,000. But you often do see these asymmetries, these experimental effects. Now, after you suspend it, you get much more pure graphene. And uh, before you anneal it, it looks like the graphene on SiO2. The G is frequently, not always, but frequently linear, proportional to uh, NS. After annealing, the conductance is much higher and it becomes distinctly nonlinear. In fact, you can then approach the ballistic limit. It looks like there's very little scattering at all. You can get mean free paths that are on the order of a micron. And people quote mobilities. Now, it's not always so meaningful to quote mobilities because it depends on where on that curve you decide you're going to choose a mobility. But they get numbers that are quite high. And I, I don't remember now what, 70,000, 100,000, 200,000, you know. But it's questionable as to what, what, what that actually means. Okay, so let's see. We'll see if we can wrap up here in a little bit. Oh, 
so we, we want to, I want to relate this a little bit. I, I'm not going to get too deeply into scattering, but we'll try to relate it a little bit. Some of the results that we've seen, we just described what's seen. You know, we haven't described really why that occurs. And the different shapes reflect the underlying scattering processes. So this lambda is the mean free path. So mean free path is the average distance between scattering events. Now we have to be a little bit careful here because we, we call this a mean free path for backscattering. When people quote mean free paths, they do it in somewhat different ways. That is, most people do it one way and we do it in a different way, right? Because what comes out naturally when you relate transmission to mean free path is this thing called mean free path for backscattering. And this is why Professor Dodd, I mentioned a factor of two. You know, the mean free path that he uses in one dimension is not V times tau. It's 2v times tau, because if on average it can scatter anywhere, if it scatters forward, it doesn't do any damage. If it scatters backwards, it backscatters and it hurts the conductance. So it takes two scattering events on average to do damage. So your mean free path for backscattering is an extra factor of 2. In two dimensions, you have to average over angle in three dimensions also. And so sometimes when you're comparing our mean free paths to other mean free paths, you have to take account of that difference. So the idea is that an electron comes in with some energy and some wave vector. It encounters some scattering potential due to a phonon or due to a charged impurity or due to a defect in the graphene lattice. And it scatters out and goes off in another direction at the same or different energy depending on whether it's elastic or, or inelastic. So 1 over tau, if tau is the average time between scattering events, then 1 over tau is the probability per second that you'll scatter, and that's what we call the scattering rate. And it depends on energy, right? High energy ones typically scatter faster than low energy ones. And there's a standard process that people use. It doesn't always work, but it's very common in semiconductor work, and you just calculate these scattering rates by Fermi's golden rule. So you, you identify the scattering potential, you sandwich that in between the wave function for the initial state and the final state and compute that matrix element and you can compute the scattering rate. And once we have the time, then we can convert it to a mean free path for backscattering. We can stick it in our transmission formula and we can compute the conductance. All right, so here I mentioned that we're in two dimensions now. So when we do this averaging over angle to get the backscattering proper, it turns out that the averaging gives you a pi over two. So you'll frequently, if you compare the mean free paths this way to the mean free paths that people frequently quote, ours will be pi over 2 times bigger. Uh, it's not about the same physics, it's just a different definition. OK, now for many scattering rates, uh, scattering processes, the scattering rate is proportional to the density of states. And that makes sense. So I have an electron coming in at some energy E. It can scatter to some state. Let's say it's elastic. If there are more states to scatter to, it'll, if there are twice as many states at that energy, it'll scatter twice as much, assuming that the, that the uh, interaction potential is the same at that energy. So it's reasonable to assume that the scattering rate is proportional to the, to the uh, density of states. In graphene, the density of states is proportional to energy. So the average time between scattering events for a reasonable scattering mechanism would be proportional to 1 over energy. So high energy ones would scatter more quickly and it would be smaller than low energy ones. So the energy, the mean free path then would be V times tau with this pi over 2. So the mean free path would be proportional to 1 over energy. So this happens for acoustic phonon scattering. It happens if your scattering potential is a delta function. Your scattering rate is just proportional to the final density of states. Okay. Now, it's very interesting in graphene that this, this does something very interesting to the conductance that this fellow Andau observed many years ago. So, uh, so let's look at what would happen. This is our expression for the conductance. And I'm operating in the diffusive limit now. So the apparent mean free path is the real mean free path. And the real mean free path for this common type of scattering mechanism is proportional to 1 over energy. So look at I put a 1 over energy here. I had an energy here um, in my expression for the conductance. So the result is 
that the conductance is independent of the number of electrons in the conduction band. Right? That's not typical. You know, typically, you're used to saying, if I have twice as many electrons in the conduction band, I have twice as much conductance. For this particular type of scattering, it would be independent. So that works for acoustic deformation potential scattering or for short range scattering like a delta function. Now, what if you have charged impurity scattering? So let's say I've got the graphene sitting on SiO2 and there are charges around. Maybe they're on top of it. Maybe they're in the SiO2. They're all over the place. That pot Coulomb potential is going to affect uh, the potential in the graphene. And what it's going to do is to move the neutral point up and down. It's going to fluctuate all over the place, depending on whether there's a charge nearby, whether it's positive charge, whether it's a negative charge. So I've got that neutral point bouncing all over the place. So an electron wave comes in, and it sees all of these fluctuating potentials. And it's got a chance to reflect off of them. That's the scattering process. And you can kind of see that if the electron energy is very, very high, then these ripples and potential don't have much effect. They're, they're small compared to the electron energy, so there isn't very much reflection or scattering. So I would think that the scattering would become less important as the energy becomes higher. Okay. So that means that the mean free path should increase as the energy increases. So actually, you can go through some simple arguments calculating these scattering rates with Fermi's golden rule. And you find out that that is exactly what happens. But actually, I mean, those arguments are a little too simple. You really need to include all of the screening and everything. But even when you do that more involved uh, calculation, you typically find that for charged impurity scattering, the mean free path is proportional to energy. So what does the, a mean free path that's proportional to energy do? Well, we have our expression for conductance. If I say the mean free path is proportional to energy, then I have an energy here and an energy here. I have an energy squared. But carrier density is proportional to energy. So now the conductance goes linearly with carrier density. I get these linear plots. I can compute a mobility. It's nice and constant. And uh, this was pointed out some time ago. And this is what led people to believe, one of the things that led them to believe, that uh, if you see these linear plots, it's a signature that there's charged impurity scattering going on in this particular sample. Now, as I said, there are still things that are being debated. People have shown recently that if you have very strong short-range scattering, instead of a weak scattering potential, a very strong scattering potential that's actually inducing some mid-gap states, that you can get the same thing that can happen. And I think I saw some experiments out of the Maryland group just recently where they deliberately ion-bombarded graphene to create damage like this and they found these linear characteristics. So it's suggestive. You see these linear characteristics. If you haven't intentionally damaged it in that way, it probably indicates that it's charged impurity scattering. All right. OK, so, uh, so that's pretty much the whole story here. Let, let me just show you one, one other way that you can analyze data, which seems like a sensible way to do it. It's very, very common for people to analyze their data and quote you a mobility. But what I've suggested is that that's not always a meaningful thing to do. But a mean free path is a very physical thing. You know, we, we know what that is. And there's a very easy way. You can take the expression for the conductance. We can take the expression for the carrier density. And Professor Dada showed you this yesterday. If you just divide the conductance by the square root of the carrier density, we can deduce experimentally what this apparent mean free path is. We can do that in any sample, whether the characteristic is linear or whether it's curved in some way. We can experimentally deduce what the energy dependent mean free path is. And then we can ask ourselves, what scattering process would give us that energy dependence and kind of deduce what's going on? So if we take this data that we've been talking about again, and if we apply that procedure, we'll get mean free paths for the red curve, the annealed curve that was near ballistic that will look like this. And we'll get characteristics for the blue curve that will look like this. Uh, let's look at that red curve first. And first of all, remember, we should stay away from the region around VG equals zero because our theory doesn't apply there. And what you'll see if you go away from that is that the apparent mean free path increases slowly with energy. Higher in energy they are away from that band minimum. 
then the longer the mean free path is. So the apparent mean free path is increasing with energy. And uh, eventually it gets to a point where it's almost constant with energy. So what you would, the way you interpret that is, well, initially there's some charged impurity scattering. When you put the Fermi level high in the conduction band, that gets weak. And then the apparent mean free path is the shorter of the actual mean free path and the length of the resistor. And eventually you just hit the length of the resistor and it doesn't get any longer. And you can actually, if you know the length of the resistor, you can actually extract out from that what the real mean free path due to scattering is. And it's quite long in that sample, three and a half microns. Okay, so you can pull that out. Now, if you try to do that on the blue, we expect the mean free path is quite short. Um, in fact, we just argued that in order to get this linear dependence, your mean free path has to increase linearly with energy. So we'll stay away from this region near zero because the theory doesn't apply. But if we go out here, the mean free path is not increasing with energy, it's decreasing with energy. Ah. Now it turns out this data is complicated by the fact that uh, we're assuming here, our expression for conductance assumes that when you go to zero Fermi level, your uh, you're at the Dirac point and there's no conductance. But if you just extrapolate those points down, it doesn't go to zero, it goes to quite a large value. There's a, bit, there's a very big, in this particular sample, there's a very big residual leakage. Some kind of maybe, well, maybe along the edges, maybe somewhere there's a shunt leakage path. If you subtract it out, because that's some other effect that we're not quite clear what it is, if you subtract that out, and then do the analysis of the part that's behaving properly, then you'll get a mean free path that increases with energy the way we argued that it should to give us that kind of characteristic. And you can see that those mean free paths are a lot shorter than they were in the annealed sample. You know, instead of being microns, they're tenths of microns. All right, just what you'd expect. All right, so our general picture of these curves is something like this. If we have a ballistic characteristic, then the shape of the curve should go as the square root of the carrier density. Um, everything should be symmetrical around the Dirac point. It, it, it isn't always. Now, if the mean free path is constant, you'll get the same kind of shape. You'll just get a lower conductance, but it'll have the same square root shape. Now, on the other hand, if you see a sample where the conductance goes linearly with carrier density, most people will tell you that that's a signature of ionized impurity scattering, and you have charged impurities in your sample somewhere, and that's what's going on. If you have acoustic phonon scattering, you would get this highly unusual characteristic where the conductance wouldn't depend at all on the carrier density. Now, in practice, if you have a little bit of charged impurity scattering, and you have a little bit of acoustic phonon scattering, you're going to get the some of these two, although it'll be the minimum of whichever those are, and you'll get a characteristic that will have some shape, and it won't necessarily be square root of n sub s, but it'll be a competition between these two scattering mechanisms. And if you think you know deformation potentials well enough, you may be able to, to pull some of that information out. Oh, and these things, you know, sometimes the minimum conductance goes close to zero, but in that sample that we looked at before, it was quite far from zero. All right, so as I said, this lecture is mostly descriptive. It's showing you this is what the kind of data that people are reporting, and this is how we interpret it in terms of the kinds of concepts that Professor Dada introduced yesterday. So the general features, you can sort of understand pretty clearly what's going on, although people are still debating. Not everybody agrees. And uh, I might put Professor Oppenzeller on the spot here later by asking him which parts of this he doesn't agree with, because there probably are one or two. Uh, there, there's a nice way to analyze this data just by extracting the mean free path. And it seems to make a little more sense than extracting mobilities. Um, so I've talked about some very simple theoretical treatments, but some of the treatments of these scattering processes get much more sophisticated and people try to account for all of the details of the shapes. Uh, the actual experiments are 
frequently you see some non-idealities. They're not always symmetrical the way I've assumed that they would be. But we have a general framework that understand what's going on. Most of it makes sense. And now to Zhu Fang's question. Uh, you know, what about the contacts? You sort of assume you put these contacts on and they're ideal ohmic contacts. They have low resistance compared to the graphene. They don't play any part in the measured conductance versus gate voltage characteristic. Well, this graphene is high quality material, right? Uh, typically, its mobilities are reasonably high. Uh, the contact is some kind of metal to graphene junction. As we change the gate voltage, we're changing the potential drop across that. Uh, it may well play a role. In fact, it probably does play a role. And when we talk about junctions on the last day, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we think about PN junctions and NN junctions and um, why it, you might argue that you can take the one that's higher and assume that that's the graphene and that the other one is being contaminated because you're seeing some of the junction conductance. Okay, I think that's all I have to say. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> Now, are there, are there any questions? Well, I mean, let me look and see where we stand on our, uh, okay, yeah, so we have, do we have any questions? Or comments? Or... Can you give more knowledge on the photon, photon scattering potential you are using? Uh, um, so, so you want, so for the acoustic phonon? Yeah. Yeah, so what it is, if you look in the notes, you can see we use a very classic description of acoustic deformation potential scattering. So we're just thinking, we're just treating the longitudinal acoustic phonons with a deformation potential approach. We work it out, you work it out the way you would work out acoustic phonon scattering in any semiconductor, but there's one twist. And the twist is this two component wave function. And the two component wave function, I'll talk a little bit more about it on Friday, but. It, it suppresses backscattering. So what it does is, for the same scattering potential, it gives you less scattering than you would get in a, than you would have gotten if you had not accounted for that, that two component wave function. But outside of that, it's just a standard treatment. Now, the big question is, what is this deformation potential? And I'm trying to remember, uh, there's actually quite a wide variation in what people believe the number to be, you know, like 18, well, I say EV, is that the units? But there are lots, you know, th there's quite a wide spread as to, as to what people think it might be. You know, so it's not pinned down very accurately. And the scattering rate goes as deformation potential squared. So there's a lot of uncertainty there. Yeah. Uh, should this uh, conduction versus N plot, NS plot, you said that it doesn't go, go down that well. Uh, the it's still a quite high value of the conduction plot. Uh, which slide are we talking? Slide 33, okay. Which is, actually it's this one, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, is this because, so I see two reasons for this one thing. One could be the, because there's no band gap in graphene, so you're not able to shut it off completely. Or is it because the interface states are very crappy in this device? I honestly don't know why this is, th this is pretty high. Do you remember the first one that I showed way earlier? That one, if you extrapolated that one, the two branches, it actually went down quite close to zero. And uh, but on the slide 33, you, after you anneal the sample, it went even higher. That, that minimum point went even higher. No, so there's two, two different axes, two different y axes. You no, know Oh, are they? The y axes are different. That's why the curve higher is low. Oh, okay. I shouldn't it. Yeah. No, no, you should. So there's a red axis and the blue. Oh. The red axis yeah. actually shows that this is not true. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Then it's, then it's comparable. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so one of those uh, pictures that uh, Professor Lanson was showing before was this um, percolation type picture, right? And, and what it says is if you are drawing a cone, for your entire graphene structure, that's really not capturing what's going on. But literally, you have to picture you have a lot of little cones in different areas of your graphene. Now, imagine these little cones are offset, and you're trying to make the current really small. And I 
create an offset that is rather large between all these cones, what are you going to find? You're going to find a rather high minimum conductivity. If you manage to make all these cones nicely behaving very similarly, then I have a much better chance of benefiting from the low density of states close to the dark point. And what am I going to say? See, I'm going to see a much lower conductivity close to the dark point. So every time you perturb mm -hmm. your system a lot, a lot, meaning I have all these cones jiggling around at different spots in my graphene, I have a good chance that my conductivity is going to be high mm -hmm. in this minimum point. Do so you mean by this puddle that there are different direct points at different levels? Yeah, yeah. So a picture I think that's fair is to say, okay, make, make a typical circle size around these puddles. And every circle for me is a little cone. And every cone is slightly offset in terms of energy up and down. And now try, because all these cones are in parallel, right? These are wide structures. Now we are trying to picture, I want to make my current very small. Well, if one cone is always kind of above the, or below, that matter, the dark point, you can do whatever you want with your gate, but you're always going to have quite some conductivity. Yeah. So the mm -hmm. more, more dirty, the more impurity you have, this is the counterintuitive thing, right? Normally we are, we are seeing the more scattering, the lower the conductivity. Well, that's, that's what we argue all the time. Here for the minimum point, it's upside down. Right? Mm -hmm. The more things are disturbed, perturbed, the higher the conductivity is. Because you're trying so hard to make the conductivity small. You're arguing from the population. Yes, yes, from this conductivity. So you're, you're saying uh, you're, that the difference between this one and the earlier one is that there's much, the, the fluctuations in potential are much larger in yes. this one. Yes, and it's okay. a wide structure. Yeah. That's at least my take on it. And it increases your chances yeah. of having always quite some nice conducting time, right. yes. And the thing that's confusing me just a little bit is that I think this mean free path up that I extract up here is about what the other one was. Mm -hmm. And you know, and this mean free path is thought to still be um, affected by those charged impurities, the, the, presumably the same charged impurities that are responsible for the puddling. So the and yet the mean free paths end up being the same once you get away from that regime. Yeah. I guess this yeah. is also very similar to the puddle size that you're having, yeah. right? And if the width of these structures is of the order of several micrometers, which it often is, then I, I believe there's a good reason to assume that there are always some kind of parallel path through the structure. Yeah. Could be. Uh, but how can you be so confident about that? Because uh, even, for example, in the March night, uh, when you put down a dial track, your formula will almost pin almost pinned that so, uh, at the ECNL, it's a charge neutrality level, and that, because of that, you want to shut off the So, one of the biggest differences is here, I think nobody would debate that there is no band gap available in this structure. Yeah. Like, there is no band gap. So, so, the best thing I can do is really go to the third point where I have supposedly a very low density of state, right? And, and yes, you can argue I, I am not moving my bands anymore. Well, I see a bipolar device curve. So how do I explain that I have two branches and I'm going through a local minimum if I'm pinned at some point, right? That's also very hard to envision. And so I have an easier time to picture that something prevents me from getting very low conductivity rather than assuming that I'm not moving my bands at all. Then I would assume I have no second branch. Because I say that because in India, March night, people still see some sort of V-shaped characteristics. It's not completely flat. Mm -hmm. And that comes because of brand to brand coming from the other side too, because you have this from, from, from the... You're talking about the bipolar device characteristics that are there yeah. all the time. But keep in mind, this is a very small VDS region. So we mm -hmm. are very, very close to... I mean, we are pretending that when the gate moves things up and down, my drain board is much, much smaller than that, which is also certainly something that we have to take into account close to the other point. What you are saying is slightly different. You have the n bipolar device right. characteristic now as a drain function giving a spill of the other type of characteristic. Right. So you're saying the drain voltage is not high enough for that? That is the assumption in this entire talk. Very, very small drain voltage is being right. close to the uh, near, near equilibrium. Near equilibrium. So th this band to band tunneling. Um, so th this is the key feature of graphene PN junctions. So we'll we'll talk quite a bit about that then on Friday. Uh, you have these electron hole puddles, uh, and typically you see all of these measurements are at really low temperature, right? Zero to fifty Kelvin. So what do you think happens at uh, for measurements at room temperature to uh, to the to the hole and electron puddles, which are isolated, recombined? 
or do they coexist? Plus, uh, you have uh, thermal generation of carriers taking place anyways. So are these electron on pilots going to be contributing to the thermally generated carriers in the system? Have you looked at these characteristics at room temperature? Yes, so, uh, yes we have. And, and so look at the energy scale we are talking about. At some point, uh, Professor Lanson translated the uh, carrier concentration energy axis into an energy axis. Yeah. And the largest carrier concentration of 7 times blah, blah, blah times 10 to the yeah. 12 corresponds to 300 milli electron volts. Okay? Now, let's look at KT at room temperature, 30 milli electron volts. So we're talking about a very small portion very close to the DR point that gets affected at room temperature at all by this generation of carriers and by the catalyst effect. So because you have such a wide span of energy that you can cover with the gate watch, even at room temperature, you have a very, very easy task to get out of this thermally excited portion. Mm -hmm. I would like to, uh, if you don't mind, make a comment sure. about this ballistic versus uh, mm -hmm. scattering and context. Can we lift up one of those? Oh, sure. You, you want to yeah. use the blackboard? Yeah. yeah. So I, I, Let's see. I, I, I apologize. I mean, I, I don't want to jump to something, but I personally always have this approach every semester. It's like, I look at our first, our and then I ask myself, so what do I expect? What do I find out? And uh, Professor Hanstrom is uh, always much more careful in, in his statements, and I am, I'm, always, I'm always more outspoken and mean to uh, other people. That's why, and, uh, that's why I invited you here. Yeah, I know, I know. This is why I'm always happily participating in these kind of rum session. So imagine you, you are an experimentalist, right? You're measuring an ID VGS characteristic. And uh, it looks like this. You have any kind of current very VGS value. Now, Professor Lansom was so kind to point out to us that there is a square root dependence in the uh, uh, ballistic case, right? And then he said, oh, and there is also uh, a combination of a linear dependence and a uh, current saturation. And so if I have both, what am I going to end up with? Well, again, this, right? So if I don't look at the current, do I have a chance to tell what it is? No. Right? I, I can look at this. There's no way. OK, now we are still safe, right? Because ballistic, we know how the current is. But what if I'm telling you this is ballistic, but there were some contact effects involved? Now, let's say these contact effects for simplicity uh, is, is gate voltage independent, right? So I'm saying this wants to be a ballistic curve. And now I have some cutoff due to contacts, not acoustic phonons, but those contacts that Professor Landstrom measured mentioned. So what's the superposition of those two things? It's again a curve that looks very, very similar to what we had before. It's still not scattering. It's still not acoustic phonon. It's still not impurities. It still has a linear region. It still has a level of region. But I call it ballistic and contact effects. So please be very, very careful with all these seducing arguments about, uh, oh yeah, I know exactly this is this type of scattering mechanism and this is this. As I said, Professor Lansom is much more political than me. So, um, <laughs> right? I, I would say, as an experimentalist, it's true to say at this point there is no clear cut, 100% convincing case. And, and the least thing I would expect you to take home is be very, very careful. Ballistic plus contact may be as good as all sorts of scattering that you want to include. Thank you. So, for the four so, so this clearly does not apply. Thank you for pointing that out. So, for the for the four tonal measurement, I wanted to uh, note that did you did you see how huge these voltage probes are in comparison to the spacing between them? And that's very typical, right? Normally, in a whole bar geometry, you have that contact and that contact. And actually, this is pretty much the geometry where we have this distance, let's say, the same as the context. So what am I going to measure with these voltage probes? Right? I mean, they're clearly not just proving a potential here at this one point. They are huge, they are wide. I have scattering going on, even on the length scale of the contact size. So to be completely honest with you, I don't know exactly what I'm measuring in these types of structures, as long as I'm not making the geometry 
somehow smaller in terms of the, 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 the voltage probes being smaller. And then, of course, we know from, from uh, Supriya's work, from Professor Dutta's work and others, that in addition, it's very hard to make these voltage probes actually detect the plus K states and minus K states the way you want, that you really measure something that is meaningful in these types of structures. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's very, very hard for me to see in a gate voltage dependent measurement where the gate voltage supposedly also impact the contact regions. That's at least what we believe. Underneath the context, even things get gated. And then on top of that, now I'm asking the question, how, what do I measure with the photonal voltage probes? You're saying there are no quantity effective bonds. I understand. It should be suppressed a little bit compared to the other one. And if I see the same effect, then I'm, I can argue that the contact may not be as important. Mm -hmm. if, it is in, uh, if it is very sensitive, then I say that well, it must be contact effective. Mm -hmm. so, so we know that the mean frame, and, and again, this is open discussion to see this, this in this discussion. So the context themselves, the method, the, the reservoirs, right, also are rather close in these pictures to the channel and, and to this region. So all of these dimensions are similar. We know that the distance over which things thermalize, the hot spot in front of the context, is of the order of the mean free path, the inelastic mean free path, that is. So now my question is, how unperturbed is this region where I'm testing with the voltage probes by the contents? Are they far enough away? Because I know when I'm building hall bars and I try to do a real good job, I make my current probes far away from my voltage probes. In particular, I want to be an inelastic mean free path distance from that, right? There are all these, these experiments that show the thermalization occurs somewhere here also in the front. So I don't know that these contexts don't matter even in a four terminal configuration. I don't know. The geometry is not clean enough for me. Thank you. I'm glad I knew. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're going to still show up tomorrow. I will yell at you, but don't worry. That's OK, right? <laughs> well, this is wonderful. It's a brand new field. There's still lots, lots of things to sort out, lots of things that people are debating. So this is exactly what we wanted to convey.